Welcome everyone to the session Accelerating Quality, How a Competency Center Transformed Our Quest for Engineering Excellence by Ravi Shankar Lakshmanan and Naresh Jain. We are glad uh, Ravi and Naresh can join us today. Uh, without any further delay, I'll just, you know, uh, hand it over to you, Naresh. Thanks, Nilesh. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, it's my honor to introduce Ravi. He's been a partner in crime for, uh, for me here at GEO last four years. Uh, Ravi is uh, VP uh, at Geo Platform Limited. He's also the uh, head of DevOps uh, and responsible for a very massive rollout of uh, DevOps inside the organization. He also owns uh, QECC Quek, uh, something that we will be talking about. So I thought it would be great to hear from Ravi, his experience uh, rolling out Quek over the last uh, three and a half, four years now. Uh, so yeah, over to you, Ravi. Thank you, Naresh. Good afternoon, all. <clears throat> so, uh, you all know Naresh. Uh, not sure whether I have to introduce him. However, uh, uh, Naresh definitely has been a partner in crime, as he explained earlier. And with his uh, experience and uh, presence as the chief catalyst and founder of Accenture, I think uh, it has been a tremendous value add for me in what we have been uh, delivering. <clears throat> uh, four years working together. Uh, a lot of engineering problems that we were able to solve in geo much required because the kind of transformation we had to go through was also <clears throat> enormous and phenomenal and i believe had it not been for the partnership that we had we couldn't have achieved it so thanks Naresh, for that as well and qe happens to be just one of them right so there were many i don't want to spend a lot of time talking about a lot of things because we have a lot of content to share as uh, we spoke that three and a half four years worth of exercise that has gone in and a very limited time. <clears throat> I would like to probably organize the session as two halves, where I would start off with uh, some intro on how we went about strategizing, how we went about rolling out, how we went about building the uh, competency center of excellence or whatever you call it for the quality engineering that we wanted to put in place in GEO. And probably follow that with a few uh, live case studies or whatever we actually uh, experienced firsthand. So that is a part that I would probably want Naresh to take over. So let me start off with uh, uh, how we went about it. So uh, before uh, I do that, let me quickly share my screen. Uh, that is important. So we had a set of problems and I'm sure these problems are not unique or exclusive for Jio and I'm sure all of you would have come across those problems and we also sail through those problems to uh, come up with our center of excellence, right? So let me quickly flash the problems that he went through. Feedback from testing comes late in the development cycle, essentially because people are all interested in rolling it out and then checking whether, whether we have developed it right without actually uh, proactively baking in quality in what we do, thereby avoiding the possibility of uh, mistake proofing it. Yeah. Moreover, this lack of best practice, what happens, results in uh, long QA cycles and high change lead time, primarily because of over reliance on manual testing. Do you do all these testing, but still we end up seeing huge bugs in various environments. And uh, the biggest problem most companies, most organizations face, enterprises face, is the lack of test automation skills and expertise in teams. Adoption takes a lot of time, uh, primarily because of uh, finding the right candidates, having the right approach to bring in automation and invariably uh, the focus is mostly on the functional testing a bit of the load testing but chaos resiliency unfortunately gets missed uh, which is a sad thing but that is very very significant when it comes to enterprise rollouts so how do we solve this problem how did we go about solving this problem so we had to go through a few iterations and uh, we have probably tried to uh, put them as three uh, iterations that we went through. We, we would like to call our uh, uh, first iteration as the failed attempt one, where we were working for one of the large retail uh, e-commerce teams within Geo, and we were trying to fix a lot of problems there. So we thought, let us try with this team. And what we did, we tried to train the team, pair up with them, and probably help them uh, achieve a lot of things. So quickly walking through what we did, we paired with existing QA members on quality engineering practices. We tried to help them establish a in sprint testing process, primarily shifting left. Also help them standardize test plans and uh, you know case creation, Azure DevOps, 
stabilizing the test environments. Uh, essentially, the way to go about fixing this problem is adoption of the test pyramid, right? So that is something that we wanted to achieve. And I'm sure all of you know about the test pyramid or else we'll see what it was that we achieved towards the end of the presentation. While we do all of that, I think understanding the root cause, uh, PR reviews, diligently religiously happening was also something that we had to ensure that happened. And above all, most importantly, shift. So this is something that we try to help them do. Over and above that, we, we also had to reorganize the teams. Uh, originally, these teams were uh, uh, organized or architected as uh, tech test teams where front-end test team, back-end test team, PHP test team, Java test team, which essentially did not work for us. So we thought we will think a little different. Uh, we tried to uh, create a, a user journey, business journey wise teams and embed QA folks into the team, which helped deepen the uh, domain knowledge or expertise <clears throat> within that journey. So these are the two or these are the few major changes we try to implement and did it help? Let's see what happened. So it did help partially, not entirely. Overall cross-functional collaboration did work well. We were able to capture a lot of defects early in the cycle, but was it enough to see? So what exactly wanted improvement or needed improvement? Test automation not available or lack of test automation made this entire approach unsustainable. What happened was those embedded people or QA people in these journeys, they were often pushed to make sure delivery happened and automation got deprioritized, which was probably not the right state to be in. The quality of test cases, in-depth test cases, making them available before the dev starts was also not happening. Bugs found during regression also was very costly and uh, needed a lot of rework because of manual testing and automation was just catching up uh, very, very nascent state. Above all this, the test environment stability was also a huge challenge for us. So I think these were three major improvements that we had to work upon so we went on going about the second iteration. So we need we knew what we need to do to make it more successful. So I will quickly move on to the second iteration. We call it the partial successful second iteration, where we decided that we need to carve out, uh, or we need to carve out a, a very very competent test automation team. Right, dedicated test automation team is something that we wanted to bring in. But they were not readily available, so we had to go into the market and hire them. Uh, probably this happened towards the early days of COVID when hiring was also not easy because very difficult to find talent at that time in the market. We bring in people, we need to train all the members, fine. But what do we do with these people? We need to have a standard set of tools and frameworks. That was also equally important, which was missing at that point in time because a lot of experimentation was also happening. Then. After bringing all of these, how do we automate? We had to integrate them with the CICD pipelines. So this is what we did to uh, in the second iteration to make it more successful than our first iteration. Did it work? What worked well at that point in time was we were able to establish the automation framework and tooling for rapid test automation. Wonderful. We were also able to clear off the regression backlog, P0 and P1 force, because we had dedicated automation experts within the team, which helped us kind of, uh, you know, completely clear of the uh, reg regression backlog. Better, we were able to come up with a dedicated test automation environment that completely isolated uh, the dependencies because we were able to stub out the downstream systems with Specmatic, which helped stabilize the environment and, and, and we were able to bring down the uh, test flakiness quite a lot. So was that enough? No, we were able to identify that we had more to do what was it? In sprint automation was still a challenge. Yes, we did good on the regression part. And what we realized was we have to do this for many teams. So every time we bring in a new member, we have to train him on the standard tools, framework, our ways of working, <clears throat> et cetera, et cetera. So there was a lot of additional work after a member comes into the team. While things were getting standardized in one team, uh, different teams were still experimenting with other two tools. They were not on a standard set of tools and frameworks. So managing consistency at scale across the organization uh, continued to uh, being a challenge for us, right? So those were the set of improvements we had to then focus on. So which essentially uh, 
uh, made us think that we need to come up with something more central, which is something like a center of excellence or a competency center, where we can flush out a lot of these requirements early in the cycle and have ready-made resources available for deployment. So let us see what we did in the third attempt. So third attempt was all about a central competency center for quality engineering, <laughs> which had a charter and we had few objectives that we had to fulfill to accomplish <clears throat> this entire uh, success uh, <clears throat> uh, success factors or whatever you call it, right? So we said we need to come up with a uh, uh, approach that drives quality engineering culture within the organization. So we are talking about a cultural behavior change within the organization to bring about quality engineering at scale across the organization. So we have to shift heavily on, uh, focus heavily on shift left and test automation. We had to build uh, and maintain central tools, processes, platforms <clears throat> in order to bring in consistency and standardization. And also <clears throat> we were able, we, we have to establish partnerships with industry leaders. I'm sorry. <clears throat> we also had to take care of knowledge management, essentially ensure that we have formal and tribal knowledge built and managed within the organization. And uh, most important part of it, we had to build the team at scale for the, for the whole organization. So we had to hire, train, and onboard test automation engineers. So these were the four major objectives we, have, we had as part of this entire charter. So we will look at how we went about it. I will, uh, so initially, uh, we did not want to boil the ocean. So we started off as a small initial uh, uh, focused model where we said we will have an initial model. So the initial model looked somewhat like this. There was a quick lead. We had to partner with our HR teams. We had to identify recruiters. Uh, and we went about recruiting talent like test architect, automation lead, SDET, senior SDETs. And so once we had that in place, uh, we realized this is going to work. Then we scaled it up. To this model and this uh, uh, quick team uh, was uh, deployed across different teams or BUs or projects, whatever you may call it, based on the organization and their nomenclature and terminology. So this is a blown up, scaled up model that we did after we went about initially having the small group. So this helped us drive quality engineering. Uh, culture across the organization and the, the 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 main collaboration tool within the organization was Azure DevOps, Microsoft Azure DevOps that we use and we did not want to use any separate tool because that defeats the purpose of uh, collaboration. So we went with Azure DevOps as a collaboration platform and a lot of uh, information was available in Azure platform which was the uh, source of truth for us. So we were easily able to shift left and get uh, involved in testing very early during design and development. And we were able to focus completely on build and test automation for functional performance, security, resiliency, so all the nine yards, right? So that's precisely how we went about uh, implementing our first objective. Then how did the quick team and the project teams interacted, collaborated? Uh, we are just trying or attempting to uh, pictorial represent it, we, every team, had a test architect to start with, an automation lead. We had SDETs, senior SDETs. They were deployed along with the uh, engineering teams or the specific project teams. They had to collaborate with them. They had to help them, mentor them, enable them, and all of that. So they were collaborating with their engineering leads, test leads, manual testers, SDETs, whoever was already available. So this was the engagement model. <clears throat> what all did we enable? How all did we enable them? So quickly, uh, we had to uh, engage in the various stages of uh, the quality journey that uh, we the, the project teams were going through. We started off with automating their smoke tests, and we used an ephemeral environment for automated testing. Uh, and this was outside the sprint cycle. <clears throat> then we helped them automate the P1 test again in the uh, ephemeral environment outside the sprint cycle. We automated tests for newly developed features, features as part of the sprint cycle. Automation regression test running in need outside the sprint cycle. Automate P1 per flow testing and automate the resilience testing. And how did we deploy the teams? We had dedicated and part-time resources, uh, both from the quick team 
and from the project team. So it was a mix of dedicated and uh, kind of uh, you know flexible resources that we had both from our WEC central excellence team and the <clears throat> uh, project team. We also helped in hiring, training, and onboarding SDECs directly for the project, not bringing them into Quack and then deploying them. We have also helped them uh, hire people directly onto the project. Uh, we have loaned quite a few people and they had a, a limited time that they were engaging with the team and they used to disengage once uh, the team is ready to take the uh, EAT initiative forward. So this is the enable model, uh, model that uh, we came about. Then comes what all levels of engagement we went through, right? So we had to handhold them. And this is how we went about handholding them, working along with them. So until 10% of the P1 automation is achieved, WEC is the complete owner, they were the automation lead. Once 10% automation, P1 automation is achieved, the automation lead role is handed over to the test lead or the senior resident from the project. And WEC starts leading in sprint test automation. And once we have successfully complete one or two sprints of uh, automation, then Quick hands over the in-sprint test automation also to the project team, uh, to the test lead or the senior resident. And once we see that they are successful for two sprints, Quick is available part-time, uh, more on a consulting basis to mentor them. But Quick spends all of their focus and energy in, in, in automating the performance and resiliency tests. Finally, WEC was more a governing entity for the team where uh, we kind of uh, manage the overall EAT program at a weekly cadence level. So I believe uh, I have been able to articulate it pretty well. Uh, so that was the first objective. Second being building the central tools and platforms. <laughs> so we have kind of been able to build and deploy a, a, a varying set of tools and frameworks for the success of this entire quick uh, engagement because we have a variety of requirements in terms of tests, in terms of uh, <clears throat> application architecture. So to address all of that, we have been able to come up with a huge shopping list of uh, tools and frameworks. So I'm not going to the details of it, I think, but you can have a quick look or uh, uh, take a look at the presentation later. Moving on to the next one, coming to knowledge management. Uh, it's not very different from what normally people do in terms of building knowledge and uh, uh, retaining knowledge. We had the competency framework and skill assessment in place. We were very religious about training and certifications and a lot of workshops within the organization. On the job mentoring, we had community of practice. So we went about roadshows and telling people what we did, how we did and all of that within Geo. We made it a practice to ensure that people attended, organized internal conferences and also external conferences, right? So this was the formal accepted way of knowledge uh, management, I believe. And I think we have done a good job over there as well. Then uh, this is just a quick uh, uh, glance at the competency framework. We had a detailed competency framework, again, available for anyone to Look at it later on once you have access to the slides. Again, the fourth objective was to hire, train, and onboard the best test automation engineers. So when we bring them on board, we have to make sure that they have a career path, they have something to look up to, <laughs> because it is equally important that we uh, retain the talent. We don't want to lose it. It's very difficult to find it. So we have kind of created a career path. So an SDEC comes into the organization, he joins as an individual contributor, he can go either of the three, either one of the three uh, routes, either continue the technical track, the managerial track, or a specialist track. So, and in fact, we have a career path defined even for leadership roles up to director level. So these uh, senior uh, roles and all of that, we have the detailed JDs available. I don't know whether uh, we can share it, but we will see if it is required. We can uh, kind of uh, see how we can massage and share it. Then. Coming to the process, so this was the five-step process that we followed uh, when we came to the entire QEC process setup. Uh, this is the lifecycle management of a QEC engineer. So we have thought through all of what is required to make him successful and uh, <coughs> be uh, keen to continue this uh, 
career path. Then, while we were talking about it, it's equally important that we give a quick glance of what the recruitment process was. Yes, we go through uh, a structured process where we have a precursor during when we identified the job roles, uh, JDs, identifying lead recruiters, HR collaboration. Once all those things were in place, then we started screening resumes with the help of technical recruiters and the HR <laughs> folks. Then uh, we took the shortlisted candidates through an automated hacker earth test. And once uh, that is completed, uh, the candidate goes through a rigorous several rounds of interviewing to make sure that he's the right fit and he must also feel that he's joining the right organization for his career aspirations. And ultimately, we do the HR fitment. The detailed HR recruitment process is also attached as multiple slides here. Uh, I'm not going to spend time going through these slides. We'll just quickly glance through these slides. These are all pre-reads, right? So what did we finally achieve? Or quickly talking about the framework that we were able to put in place, yes. We have all the ingredients that we need to successfully uh, uh, you know, run the quality engineering uh, and do different types of tests required. So we have the test tools available. We have the uh, uh, integration with Specmatic. We have the Apply tools. We have the report portal IO. All of this is uh, integrated with our DevOps uh, CICD uh, pipelines. People can run mobile tests through the cloud forms and even uh, have all the reports uh, viewed in report portal. So the entire framework has all the ingredients needed to make sure that we are able to successfully complete and achieve uh, the uh, desired outcomes. This is just a double click on what the entire test uh, framework is. And again, I'm sure uh, this is, uh, I'm sure people know it or there are sessions done by uh, Anand and all in this uh, specific test phase. I'm not going to go into the details of it. Ultimately, what did we achieve? So this is what we achieved. This is the outcome that we wanted. So the test pyramid, whether we accomplished it, yes. So we have accomplished contract tests for all these labels that you see. It's Geopost, uh, Geomart, uh, Geo Enterprise, Portal, we were able to achieve the same uh, for, or we were able for the same businesses, we were able to successfully complete component API tests. We were able to complete workflow tests at epic level. And uh, we, we were able to do system tests for a larger group and not just this, right? We were able to help them uh, enable their CD and uh, through which all the automation suits were executed, not just that. So we also provided them with a report portal which makes the entire exercise very transparent. And we continue to do the governance for all of these projects in terms of strategy assessment and baselining. So this was the journey. Sorry, I had to run a little faster for uh, lack of availability of time. I will quickly hand it over to Naresh uh, for the case studies. Thank you, Naresh. Go ahead. Cool. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Ravi. That was uh, really good. Uh, let me quickly share my screen. Actually, as you were talking, I remembered we uh, didn't recognize or acknowledge people. So there was a hackathon that we had run. And uh, this is a picture from uh, the hackathon, Anand, uh, Ravi. Uh, I think Ritul is in the audience. Uh, so we had a lot of this group that was built out uh, that essentially, you know, was kind of part of the Quack team. So I'm going to quickly now double click into some of the case studies and talk about what is that we uh, try to do, right? So the first one, I want to look at the POS, which is uh, something that is very, very widely used inside Geo, uh, you know, or, or outside Geo as well. Uh, you know, and the objective there was to essentially help the team establish contract-driven development, improve the DevX and improve the overall quality and obviously hand it over, right? So this is kind of a snapshot how we used to track across uh, these initiatives where we say, okay, what is the impact, right? Uh, you know, basically when we started, there were zero uh, automated tests across, uh, you know, 60 microservices and uh, one front end app. 
uh, you know, at the end of two months, basically we had uh, 2,838 tests uh, that were running in the pipeline. It provided 54% branch coverage from this. And, uh, you know, these are the pipelines. Uh, uh, so total out of the 100% uh, 100 of the pipeline, 74% uh, actually we were able to accomplish. And we had to touch, uh, you know, different uh, technologies from a stubbing point of view, HTTP, SOAP, Kafka, Redis, and so forth, right? And when we started, uh, the driver for these was a QECC team and then gradually handed over to the POS team itself. And then the QECC team would disengage, right? This is a typical pattern we would follow because like Ravi explained, this was an acceleration team. It would come in, accelerate your journey and then kind of hand over so that the team can run with it, right? So what are the kinds of things, right? I mean, it's uh, if you look at a typical, uh, what would happen is that you would have an app that would have a backend uh, service, and then that would talk to some dependent services. So what we would do is initially uh, plug in Specmatic to uh, essentially record the traffic, uh, and then that would allow us to generate an open API specification, which would then allow us to do intelligent service virtualization, right? So this was something that is a common pattern as a starting point with several teams that we would do. And this would allow us to test the service in isolation uh, and all these tests are auto-generated, so you don't have to handwrite them. And this would give a pretty good jump start to a lot of teams, right? Uh, you know, in, in case of POS team, they had a lot of uh, stuff in the database. And so it was not easy to just isolate the database. So what we ended up doing in this case was essentially uh, loading the database through a dump script uh, and bringing it up in a test container. And so this would be a typical kind of a setup that would be done where there is heavy reliance on uh, where there's logic in the database itself that you want to also exercise. Right, so this is another uh, case where uh, if there's a MySQL dependency, we would, uh, you know, do this right with this particular team. And finally, on the front end, right, so there was basically the GeoPOS app, which is essentially a hybrid app uses React uh, inside. And that talks to backend services uh, which are running in SID. So what we would do is again we would use the same technique of uh, you know stubbing it out so that uh, you know you would be able to test the app uh, in isolation from the backend services, and you would be able to complete an entire flow or a journey, right? So in this case, a uh, buying a SIM card journey or basically you know returning or recharging a SIM card, all of that journey could be completed completely without having to uh you know deploy all the services and stuff like that this also i mean later on there is a talk by hari today he's going to double click again into the details of some of these things and this is quick snapshot right basically uh we started in february and in april we handed it over to the team and uh, you'd see that there was a two week poc that kicked it off then basically there was eight qecc members with a coach uh, and there were two dev members and a lead from the team side uh, that basically took this. And as we scaled it out, you would see that the test count have uh, increased uh, over the period of time. And finally, uh, the team was in the driver's seat and the QECC member was purely from a governance point of view. Uh, kind of what Hari, uh, what Ravi has explained, I just put it on a timeline and uh, from a screenshot of a real tool, right? So this is a visualization tool that we had in Geoscope where we would actually track every project and look at what, what is the progress. Uh, so this is, this is again a real time dashboard uh, that gives us a view of how uh, this team progressed, right? This is basically uh, the Geopos team and this is kind of showing the progress on uh, several fa factors over here. And so you can see the test count has improved and stabilized over a period of time. Uh, you know, this is obviously an older screenshot. Things have moved, moved much further now. Uh, this is quick snapshot from the, uh, so th I'm just trying to highlight all the kinds of measurements that we would put in place to make sure that this program is progressing in the right direction. So this is a code coverage snapshot of the front end app uh, for specifically a recharge journey. And you would see that by stubbing out the backend service and doing service virtualization through Specmatic, you were able to achieve a very good uh, coverage uh, you know, to give us the confidence, right? So 76% branch coverage is pretty reasonable in my opinion, uh, that too in a duration of two months time. Uh, 
uh, and some of these flows are fairly complicated flows for recharge and stuff like that. Uh, so quickly, again, jumping uh, into the second case study, I know we're running out of time, but the second was uh, another team, which is the Geo, uh, uh, you know, uh, GeoMart uh, partner team. And uh, this is the B2B side of things. This is where uh, we had a set of microservices around 30, uh, 39 microservices. And uh, the team already had certain test cases, but as you can see, the branch coverage on this was very low, right? 6% branch coverage. So we worked with the team to uh, improve the branch coverage to 48% and got a lot of those running in the pipeline itself. Uh, here, the complexity in terms of the stack was a lot more, right? You had Elasticsearch, you had uh, Redis, you had Feature Hub, JMS, Kafka, uh, you know, a lot of lot more technology that had to be uh, handled. And again, you can see the progress in terms of the test count over a period of time and the number of defects that the CDD initiative would help them find uh, and uh, kind of keep a track uh, in terms of this. Next one is an interesting, uh, again, case study, which is uh, on the telecom side. Uh, there's a team called Enterprise, which has a uh, geo enterprise portal, JEP. Uh, and uh, when we analyzed, uh, you know, this uh, the bugs that were being found in the system integration SIT uh, environment, we found that uh, you know there's quite a few bugs in JEP, and uh, they were, uh, you know, a lot of these were due to, uh, you know, again regression issues, but also due to poor, uh, you know, interface design in terms of like, uh, you know. Uh, the uh, integration and the UI interface and stuff like that. So we deployed 22 uh, QECC members for a period of three months. Uh, and essentially what we try to do here is uh, fix some of the problems that are highlighted here. The test plans were not available. RCAs were missing. Uh, poor automation in lower environments. Poor test data management practices. And you know practically not a lot of uh, automation that runs on path to production, right? Like in the pipelines. Uh, so we wanted to basically shift left and establish UI component workflow tests. Uh, some of the technology here used is also quite dated. So I'll show you the workflow that typically would happen for an SD WAN kind of a product, right? Uh, this is a purchase code creation workflow where a user would log in into the screen and then select in the drop down that would, you know, pop up another. Uh, war file, another UI where you get into the SD WAN products PQ creation page that would then make calls uh, over uh, HTTP to its own uh, backend, and that would then you know talk over SOAP to uh, you know to other uh, services and even to its own database through a wrapper API database wrapper. Now uh, you know the. the Trying to test something like this is quite challenging and interesting. So what we ended up doing is essentially simulate the login already, uh, and through uh, you know through Selenium's uh, network uh, callback, we would actually stub out the login, uh, launch the page directly, and then essentially uh, all the backend, even the database and the backend systems were stubbed out using Specmatic over here. So this would allow us to do the entire uh, purchase code creation workflow completely through this pipeline itself. Uh, again, so Specmatic, Report Portal, Apply Tools, uh, a lot of integrations were done. I'll quickly run through, I know we are out of time. Uh, this is another case study of uh, you know, a geo where we had to automate 260 uh, test cases, bring down the overall time it takes for regression from two days to 1.5 days. Uh, you know, and uh, central reports uh, in uh, report portal, uh, you know, dashboards for making decisions, uh, you know, visual testing integration with uh, Apply tools for, uh, you know, visual testing for a geo uh, test automation. I think some of the things that uh, Ravi pointed out. So again, sorry, I'm a little out of time, but I'll quickly run through. These are all the kinds of various integrations and things that we've done as part of different case studies. So we've highlighted maybe four or five case studies here, uh, and the team continues to work and influence a lot more teams inside Geo. Uh, I think we are pretty much exhausted the time, but- uh, maybe 10 minutes left. Time. Yeah. Quick reminder, 10 minutes left. Okay, so we do have 10 minutes left, right? Perfect. 
So what we could do is again, uh, you know, maybe use the time for Q and A. Uh, so I'll stop sharing screen and maybe uh, we can use this time. I kind of run through a bunch of case studies and talk through quickly. Uh, so we could look at uh, some questions folks have and try and address that, right? Cool. Uh, I see a question from uh, Sarabhat. Uh, what is the dev to QA ratio? Uh, that is an interesting question. What is the dev to QA ratio? I do not believe we try to, uh, you know, adhere to a standard dev to QA ratio. Uh, you know, back in the ThoughtWorks days, I know uh, we used to have a one is to eight, like one tester to eight developer kind of QA ratio. Uh, but given the complexity of the products in Geo uh, and the amount of external integrations that we have, uh, I do not. Uh, we do not have like a standard recipe that across different teams we have a standard ratio. So for each team that if we talk about that we looked at, we would have different ratios. Some would be in the range of uh, eight is to one, uh, eight developers to one tester. Some would be in the range of four is to two, that is four developers to two testers. Uh, and so it ranges quite a bit depending on the complexity and the scale of the product that we were working with. I hope uh, that answers your question. Quickly looking at the next question from Anonymous. Uh, what are the key KPIs or metrics that QECC uh, team would uh, use and track to measure productivity of the QA SZ engineers? So I think I try to highlight uh, some of those uh, through the case studies of the things that we would measure uh, that would you know look at essentially how many tests are running in the pipeline, et cetera. These are what we call as health metrics. So there's a set of uh, metrics that we would measure uh, in terms of uh, you know how is how effective is uh, QECC itself, right? In from a, a quality engineering point of view, so there are things around uh, you know test automation, branch coverage, uh, the number of uh, things running in the pipeline, stability of the pipelines, etc. Right. So these are all that gives us an indication whether uh, as a practice are we doing it well, right? Uh, so we call those health metrics. And then we step back and we look at what we call as value metrics, which is basically the outcome, right? Like what was the outcome of doing all of this? And so there, I think Ravi touched upon one of them, which was the, uh, you know, lead time, right? Like basically the change lead time, CLT, which is once dev is done, how long it takes to get to production. Uh, so we look at cycle time, we look at CLT, we look at flow efficiency, we look at leakage, uh, bug leakage that is happening to different environments, we look at defect density that is being reported later. So those are some of the metric that we would look at from a, a value perspective, uh, you know, like how quickly are we able to, are we able to reduce the time to market, right? So the, the cycle time, uh, flow efficiency, all of these things help us understand that. Then we look at uh, any stability of things, right? So that's where we look at uh, bug leakage and things like that to make sure that. Probably. Sorry, Ravi. Yeah, go ahead. Build, build success. Build success. Yeah, build success and all of that uh, is what we were looking at in terms of the health metric to make sure uh, that, uh, you know, when these practices are put in place, they're actually giving a good, uh, you know, benefit to the team from a DevX point of view and from a, a DevOps point of view. But after doing that, what is the benefit, right? Did we reduce the time to market, right? That's measured by cycle time. Did we improve the stability of what was released there? There we would measure things like basically availability, SLOs and stuff like that. Uh, so the, the dashboard that I just showed in the uh, in one of the slides, that was more of the health metric dashboard. We had a similar dashboard for the value metrics, all tracked under the same tool called NGOscope. Hopefully that uh, answers your question. Okay, another question from Anonymous. According to your QECC model, who drives uh, one, innovation, two, tech debt, three, POCs for Gen AI integration, four, scalability and performance, five, tracking progress and productivity? Okay, uh, I think that's a good question in terms of basically, uh, QECC may not be responsible for everything that you've highlighted here. For example, tech debt is not something that QECC would track, right? Uh, tech debt is something that the engineering managers typically own and drive inside Geo. 
POCs for Gen integration, uh, Gen AI integrations. There is a, uh, a, a Gen AI or an AI, uh, you know, center of excellence that basically drives uh, POCs around this. They work with teams to do the integration. And I'm sure you're aware that in Geo, the amount of uh, extent to which AI has been integrated and in, uh, uh, you know across products is fairly uh, high in terms of the maturity at this point. So that is not something that QECC would try and solve that problem. Innovation again is not something that QECC would try and solve the problem. Scalability and performance, uh, you know. That belongs to QECC, so that that is something that QECC would look at from a performance testing and quality, uh, you know, from a performance engineering point of view. Uh, so certainly that would go under the charter of QECC. Tracking progress and productivity again would go under PMT, which is a separate group, uh, process method and tools group for uh, you know ensuring the right tooling uh, is provided and then tracking progress and productivity through that. Uh, so again, uh, you know, th there is different groups that are responsible for each of these. QECC is predominantly responsible for quality engineering specific focused activity. Hope that uh, answers that question. Okay, uh, there is a question from Rishabh. I guess Specmatic does not support uh, asynchronous or Kafka. How would you take care of communication between microservices? Uh, that is not true. So Specmatic does uh, handle Kafka and uh, this thing, like I highlighted, there were quite a few teams that do use Kafka, JMS, uh, Google PubSub. So we do, uh, you know, in Specmatic, we do support, uh, uh, you know, async. And so that is very important part. And so you're absolutely right that, uh, you know, async is important and needs to be, uh, there should be a clean way to stuff that out. So uh, Specmatic does handle that for sure. Next question is from Mohammed Zaid. Uh, what has uh, the difference been like between the traditional approach and this approach in terms of the total uh, development time of a product? Uh, that's a great question in terms of basically what has been like, is there a quantifiable reduction in cycle time, uh, you know, by, by having uh, a, a approach like this, right? Uh, so I would expand that question saying, has there been a reduction in cycle time? Uh, and second, has there been, what has been released? Has there been an improvement in the stability of what has gone out, right? Because both of them are important. Like you can release things faster, uh, but if they're not stable, then you will end up getting a lot of, uh, you know, uh, support issues and things like that, right? So in the teams that we have worked, we've been tracking the cycle time and we've been tracking the leakage. Uh, both of them uh, have significantly improved. Uh, again, different teams will vary in terms of the actual results that were accomplished. Uh, we can like maybe later uh, show some of these things uh, you know, to you guys uh, if you're interested in the Hangout table in terms of specific metric for uh, teams that we track through NGOscope. Okay. Uh, last one minute, I will uh, quickly look at a couple of more questions. What dashboards did you use uh, a while ago? Uh, there is a open source tool uh, that we built inside uh, Geo. It's called uh, NGOscope. This is basically the dashboard that tracks the productivity metrics. But we also had a dashboard that I showed earlier, which was using report portal. Uh, that is for tracking all the test case uh, results and stuff like that. So I'm not sure which uh, dashboard you're referring to, but uh, there were two dashboards. One was NGOscope for, uh, you know, yeah. So NGOscope, uh, not NGO, uh, it's called uh, NGOscope as in, uh, it, it was inspired from like an angiography of the heart that you do, like this was, uh, for engineering organization and NGO graph of what's going on, right? So it gives you uh, details about the quality of your, uh, you know, what what is basically the health of your branches? Uh, what is the health of your uh, pipelines? What is the health of uh, the different things? So that, that's a fairly detailed dashboard that we had. Okay, I guess we I have time. time. Uh, yeah. Again, I, I think there are some lot of great questions here and uh, both Ravi and I will be available in the Hangout table. Uh, if there are more questions, uh, happy to address that. Sure, thanks Naresh. Uh, thanks Ravi for sharing your experience today. That was quite valuable.